Hi and welcome to another story and today we have the final part, part 11 of Best Friends by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from chapter 17. Biscuit's mum had made me my very own Fat Larry emerald sparkly suit. I clasped it to my chest and danced around with it, the empty green arms wrapped around my neck. Oh Mrs McVitie, it's wonderful, you made it specially for me, you're so kind. Well, Billy said he badly wanted you to have his this Fat Larry suit too. You see, I had the material anyway. I bought yards and yards of it because my Billy's a growing lad and I can't always keep up with what its size he is. Bless him. It took me no time at all to run up a little mini suit for you. I've sewn in a cushion for extra padding round your tum. You're a little tiddler compared with the McVitie's. I gave her a big hug. Grandad said how very, very grateful he was. Mrs McVitie made biscuits and me special strawberry ice cream sodas. We scooped up the ice cream with long silver spoons and then slurped up the soda through red straws. Biscuit's granny made Grandad a cup of tea and gave him a slab of her own homemade millionaire shortbread. Grandad said no millionaire could possibly buy better food and he smacked his lips together, making enthusiastic mmm noises. It sounded as if he was kissing someone. Biscuit's granny giggled like a girl, almost as if he was kissing her. Biscuit's and I had a slab of millionaire shortbread too, of course, but we ate it up quickly, but appreciatively. Licked the chocolate from our lips, took our gorgeous sparkly suits and retired to the garden to work on our Fat Larry routine. We worked and worked and worked on it, day after day. We watched Grandad's video again and again until we'd got Fat Larry's smile and bouncy walk and catchphrases off Pat. We poured over Biscuit's Fat Larry cookery books, mouths watering, picking out recipes. I had big ideas about a camping stove so we could make crepes in the classroom, but when I had a quiet word with Mrs Watson she rolled her eyes at the very idea. I suppose it would be one way of testing the efficiency of the school's fire extinguishers, but I don't think my nerves would stand it, Gemma. Don't worry, Mrs Watson. It wouldn't be me doing the cooking, it would be Biscuits. He's very nearly as accident prone as you are, and if you're within a hundred yards of a camping stove, I know it would spontaneously combust. You never gave me the benefit of the doubt, Mrs Watson. That's very true, young Gemma. Mrs Watson put her head on one side. What exactly are you and Biscuits up to? We're cooking up something very special, I said, cracking up laughing, but I promise we won't do any proper cooking on school premises. We'll have to act like Blue Peter, people say. Here's one I prepared earlier. Barry Baxter did a brilliant project based on the Blue Peter presenters, going right back to the days when Mum and Dad watched Peter and John and Val. Barry did it all very seriously, but he had some funny bits too, and he made everyone giggle when he mentioned that naughty baby elephant. I giggled too, but I started worrying. It looked like Barry might be a clear winner. The rest of the class didn't offer much competition. I was so glad Biscuits had persuaded me not to go for Michael Owen. There were so many footballers, I would have kicked myself. Half a dozen kids picked Harry Potter as a hero, saying the same old hogwarty hogwash till we nearly all went potty. There were girl bands and boy bands and Justins and JLos, all strutting the same old stuff. I begged Mrs Watson to let Biscuits and me do our project first thing after break time, so we'd have time to prepare. We were so busy preparing there wasn't time to eat anything. A first for both of us. Never mind, we'll eat our fill afterwards, said Biscuits, getting all the goodies out of his rucksack. Don't you dare nick a toffee now, Gemma, or there won't be enough to go round. Just one little lick, I said, teasing him. Then I looked at the classroom clock. Quick, the bell's going to go any second. Let's get our gear on. We pulled our emerald sparkly suits on over our school uniform. I combed my hair back behind my ears. We both scribbled a black felt tin Fat Larry moustache over our lips and then we beamed and waggled our eyebrows, Fat Larry style. We're looking good, said Biscuits. Better than good. We're the best, I said. Everyone fell about laughing when they came into the classroom and saw twin Fat Larrys in emerald green sparkly suits. Even Mrs Watson laughed until tears trickled down her cheeks. You too, she gasped. Oh Gemma, oh Biscuits. Biscuits and I shook our heads. We're not Gemma and Biscuits, I said. We're Fat Larry. I nodded at Biscuits. He nodded at me. Hey, you guys, we said in Fat Larry's big friendly boom. It's Fat Larry time to give your tums a treat. Biscuits patted his own substantial stomach and I patted my cushion. We did our little Fat Larry shot soft shoe shuffle. Step, tap, step, tap, step, tap, step, kick sideways. I stepped and tapped and kicked with my left leg and Biscuits stepped and tapped and kicked with his right leg. So it looked like we were mirror images of each other. Hey, you guys, you're looking slightly sad -o. We'll cook you something to sweeten you up, we chorused. Biscuits produced a saucepan and a wooden spoon. Mrs Watson twitched. Gemma, I said you couldn't cook, she hissed. Cool it, little lady, I said daringly, Fat Larry style. It's not like real cooking. 
Everyone craned their necks to see Mrs. Watson's response. OK, Fat Larry, I'll cool it just this once, she said, and everyone giggled. I read out the recipe for ultra-sticky, yummy toffee, while Biscuits mimed making it with a pan and a spoon. Then he held up Baby Polly's toy clock and whizzed the big hand round to indicate the passage of time, while I whipped out the big tin of toffee he'd already made. We handed it round and everyone helped themselves, even Mrs. Watson. Well done, she said ind indistinctly, her teeth stuck together with toffee. This is only the appetizer, I said. Wait till you see our main course, said Biscuits. It's highly appropriate, I said, as Biscuits returned to his pretend kitchen at the front of the classroom. This is Fat Larry's special chocolate biscuit cake. I read out the recipe in Fat, Fat Larry's voice, smacking my lips and going yummy, yummy at appropriate intervals. Biscuit stirred his imaginary ingredients and then put his cake into the store cupboard, which we'd quickly labelled fridge. I made Polly's clock fast forward rapidly and Biscuits took the real chocolate biscuit cake out of the cupboard with a flourish. Everyone clapped and cheered when Biscuits got his knife and started cutting the cake into 30 chunky cubes. Biscuits saved me a slice with extra cherries. The extra cherry on our cake was Mrs Watson announcing we'd won the contest for the best project. Barry came second. Biscuits promised to make him a special Blue Peter cake as a consolation prize. What about making me a cake, I said. I'm working on a special cake for you, said Biscuits. Just be patient for a week or two. I knew what he was getting at. He was planning on making me a cake for my birthday party. There was just one problem. I didn't want a birthday party this year. Every single sausage on its stick and each egg sandwich and all the fancy fairy cakes would remind me unbearably of Alice. I couldn't stand the thought of another birthday cake, but Biscuits seemed so keen on the idea that I didn't want to upset him. I told Mum and Dad without telling them what had happened to my last birthday cake. How about a birthday supper instead of a birthday tea, Dad suggested. You could choose your favourite cooked meal. Not spaghetti bolognese, said Mum. Anyway, I don't think I could manage a proper cooked meal for everyone after I've done a full day at work. Mum, I told you ages ago, I don't want the kids in my class to come to a party, I said. Well, maybe I want biscuits, but nobody else, just family. Callum will want to invite Aisha. Grandad's coming, of course. And what about biscuits, family? It's about time we invited them back his mum and his dad, and there's a baby sister, isn't there? And his granny June. We certainly can't leave her out, said Grandad. That's ten and a half people, said Mum. Where are they all going to sit? And what am I going to cook? Oh dear, I wish Mrs McVitie wasn't such a brilliant cook. She's not a patch on her mum, said Grandad, smacking his lips reminiscently. Pizzas, said Dad. We'll have takeaway pizzas in the garden, with beer for the men, wine for the women, and coke for the kids. Simple. We'll finish up with the boy's cake, and we'll all sing happy birthday to our gem. Is that what you'd like, darling? You've gone awfully quiet. I had a lump in my throat like I'd swallowed a stone. They were trying so hard to be kind to me and make my birthday special. Only it wouldn't work. It wasn't what I wanted. I just wanted Alice to be sharing our birthday the way she always did. Dad was looking at me eagerly. They were all looking at me. I had to think about what they wanted. I swallowed very, very hard and got rid of the stone. Pizzas in the garden sounds like a super idea, I said. Yummy, yummy. My voice went a bit weird and squeaky, and I had to blink hard to stop myself bursting into baby tears. It's going to be a brilliant birthday, I gabbled, and then I charged upstairs and locked myself in the loo, where I could cry in private. Chapter 18. I woke up very early on my birthday. I waved to Melissa, sitting in a petticoated splendour on my windowsill. She waved back with her stiff white arm. I kicked my dolphin duvet off and lay beached on my bed, arms and legs flung wide. Happy birthday, me, I whispered, and then, happy birthday, Alice. I stuck my right thumb and little finger out, making my hand a pretend phone. Happy birthday to us, happy birthday to us, happy birthday, dear Al and Jem, happy birthday to us, I sang softly. There was a snuffling sound outside my door. Barking Mad came nosing in to give me a big birthday lick. I patted him and felt a lump hanging from his collar. It was a tiny packet of chocolate drops with a message. Happy woof woof birthday with love from Barking Mad. His handwriting was very similar to Jack's crazed scrawl. I gave Barking Mad a big hug and we shared my birthday treat together. One chocolate drop for me, one chocolate drop for him. What's all this? said Mum, coming into my bedroom in her dressing gown. You know Barking Mad is not allowed to eat chocolate drops. Mind Mum doesn't find out or you'll be in terrible trouble. I giggled and Barking Mad drooled. Cat, happy birthday, Gemma darling, said Mum, giving me a kiss. She handed me a pink tissue parcel tied with a polka dot ribbon. I shook it for clues. Careful, said Mum. I saw the word makeup faintly showing through the pink tissue. Oh dear, it looked like Mum had taken me seriously about wanting to be girly. 
I tried to pin a smile on my face as I ripped the tissue off. Then I smiled properly, a great grin from ear to ear. It wasn't ordinary girly pink lippy and peach powder. It was a box of stage makeup with all kinds of colour sticks, zingy oranges and crimsons, wild greens and greys and deep blues. I stared at the sticks and saw myself, made up as the Incredible Hulk, Spider-Man, Dracula, the Lion King. My starring roles were endless. There was even a stick of black to make an excellent Fat Larry moustache. Oh, Mum, it's magic, I said. I rushed to the mirror to start experimenting. Hey, hey, you haven't even washed yet, said Mum. Yeah, well, I'll need to wash after, won't I, I said. I came downstairs to my birthday breakfast as a blood-crazed vampire with chalk-white face, purple eyes and blood dripping down my chin. My school uniform rather spoiled the effect, so I draped a sheet around me, hoping it looked like a shroud. Everyone cowered away from me in a very satisfactory manner. Mum made pancakes for a special birthday treat. She declined my offer of help. I dolloped strawberry jam on mine and pretended it was blood. I looked around hopefully for presents, even though I had to morph back into a girl and go to school in ten minutes' time. Callum saw my eyes roving and laughing. OK, OK, my presence in the hall, he said. It was my own bike. Oh, Callum, you're so great. A new bike. Yeah, I'm very great. But it's not new, dope. It's Aisha's old bike. We've stripped it down and painted it up for you. You like? I love, I said, jumping on the bike and trying it out there and then. Gemma, get off that bike. Watch the carpets and the walls, Mum yelled. No sweat, Mum. I know what I'm doing, I said, taking my hands off the handlebars. But then the postman thrust a wadge of envelopes through the letterbox, startling me. My new bike went whizzing down the hall and I didn't manage to keep up with it. Watch the paintwork, Mum screamed. Oh, Jem, don't bash the bike up before you even had a ride on it, Callum yelled. I checked the bike and the paintwork. For once, I was in luck and both were undamaged. I sifted my way through the letters. Bills, more bills, birthday cards from old aunties and cousins and all sorts. But not the card I was looking for. I went through the post all over again in case I'd missed it, though I could pick out Alice's handwriting from the other side of the room. I'd sent her a birthday card. I'd made it myself. It was like a collage with photos from every birthday we've ever had in the past, all the way back to our first birthday when we were sitting in adjoining high chairs with our first birthday cake. Alice was very daintily licking her icing. I had cake all over me, even in my hair, and I was yelling because I wanted another slice. I cut lots of balloons and birthday cakes from Mum's magazines and stuck them all in the gaps, and then stuck a border of silver stars all round my collage. It was all a bit sticky and top-heavy when I'd finished, but I hoped Alice would appreciate it anyway. I hoped she'd like her present too. I'd spotted it in Mum's catalogue, a pink fluffy cushion in the shape of a heart. It was very, very pink and very, very fluffy. I thought it would be perfect in Alice's new bedroom. It was also very, very expensive for a girl with no savings whatsoever, but Mum let me open up an account with her so I could pay it off weekly. I would take up all my pocket money for ages and ages, almost until our next birthday, but it was worth it. I tried not to mind that Alice hadn't sent me anything, not even a card. I couldn't help crying just a little bit when I was scrubbing my vampire face off, but maybe that was because I'd got soap in my eyes. Where's the vampire gone, said Jack, when I came out of the bathroom. It's daylight, so he's flown away, I sniffed, mopping my sore eyes. Pity, here's a birthday present he'd like, said Jack, thrusting a black shiny paper package into my hands. When I tore it open, I found a black plastic wallet with bats flying all over it, teeth bared. Oh, thanks, Jack, it's a cool wallet, I said. Try opening it, said Jack, as he went into the bathroom to have his ten-second wash and brush up. Try opening it. I pulled it open and found a twenty-pound note inside. Jack, I hammered on the door. What? Jack, come out. I want to give you a hug. No fear. I'll have to stay locked in here now. Oh, Jack, how come you're so generous this birthday? You're usually really stingy when it comes to presents. Oh, thanks a bunch. Miss Tact and Diplomacy. Actually, I'm not really being generous this time. The wallet was a freebie with my fantasy gore fanzine, and the money's just your earnings. My earnings? All those rubbish jobs you did for me, so I'd let you use my computer. I started to feel a bit mean about it. You can use it any time you want, kiddo. There wasn't any point now. I was 100% certain old cake face wouldn't feel like passing on any messages. It felt lonelier than ever sitting next to an empty seat at school. Still, I could always turn around and talk to Biscuits. He gave me a great birthday card for a big boy of a big boy sitting at a huge table spread with hundreds of cakes, ice cakes, cream cakes, cheesecakes, every kind of cake you can think of. He was clutching an eclair in either hand, making bites out of both, with a big beam of bliss upon his face. The card said on the front, I like cakes, 
and then inside Biscuits had written, but I like you more. Oh, Biscuits, I said, blushing. What are you giving Gemma, Biscuits? Why has she gone bright red? Show us what he's put, Gem. Hide it quick, said Biscuits, blushing beetroot too. I shoved it into my school bag while Mrs. Watson clapped her hands together and told everyone to settle down. Some idiot tried to grab my school bag, so I bonked them hard with it. Gemma, said Mrs. Watson, you settle down too. You'll find yourself in serious trouble, even if it is your birthday, which reminds me. She put an envelope on my desk. Mrs. Watson had a special birthday card for me. It had a picture of a very fierce old-fashioned teacher with a mortarboard and a cane saying, behave yourself. Mrs. Watson had written inside, have a very happy birthday, and she'd drawn herself with a smiley face. It was just an ordinary old school day, of course, and we had to do the same old boring lessons. But at playtime, Biscuits and I had a see how quickly you can munch a bar of chocolate competition, and I won. As Biscuits' teeth seemed to have superior chomping skills to mine, I think he might have been chewing deliberately slowly just to let me win. Grandad was waiting for me at the school gates when the bell went. He didn't just give me a birthday hug, he picked me up and whirled me round and round, though he whizzed, wheezed a bit when he put me down again. Then he retrieved my birthday present from the pavement. It was Fat Larry's special easy-peasy cookery book for beginners. You wouldn't mind if I borrowed it off you once or twice, would you, Jem? I'm thinking of asking someone round to supper. and Needed a bit of a help, especially as the lady herself is an excellent cook. Just which someone might this be, Grandad? I asked, giggling. Ah, that would be telling, said Grandad. Might it be a certain someone you'll be seeing shortly at my birthday supper, I said. A certain elderly, elderly rep relative of my mate Biscuits. Hey, hey, not so much of the elderly. The lady's in the very prime of her life, said Grandad. We didn't go to Grandad's. We went back to my house to help get everything ready for my birthday supper. Mum was still at work and Callum and Jack were still on their way home from school. But Dad was up and calling to us from the garden. He'd given the grass a quick mow and got out all the garden chairs and covered the mossy old, old, old table with the embroidered tablecloth. There was another old ta older tablecloth bunched over something big and bulky up in the tree. Goodness, what's that, Dad? I said. I is it going to be a bird feeder for giant eagles? It's my birthday surprise for you, Jem, said Dad. He stretched up on his tiptoes and whirled the cloth away like a bullfighter flourishing his cloak. It was my tree house. It was a total beauty, with a neat rope ladder and an arched doorway and a proper roof. Oh, Dad, it's so cool, I gasped. I went flying up the ladder straight away. There was a little notice on the door, Gemma's Den. Inside, on the wooden plank floor, Dad had put a big fat cushion and a little shelf for my favourite storybooks. I couldn't help wishing there were two cushions, but I was trying hard not to think about Alice now. It's the best treehouse ever, and you're the best Dad, I yelled. I wanted to stay in my treehouse all afternoon, but the minute, ma minute Mum came rushing home from work, she made me go and have a bath. Then you can put on your party clothes. I've washed your yellow dress and it's come up a treat. Mum paused. She grinned. <laughs> your face, Gemma. I'm just teasing. Put on your best jeans and a clean t-shirt, OK? She made Callum and Jack bathe and change too, which they weren't very thrilled about. Biscuits looked as if he'd just emerged from a piping hot bath when he arrived because he seemed extra shiny pink and scrubbed twinkling emerald sparkles in his Fat Larry suit. Biscuit's mum was wearing her pink meringue outfit and Biscuit's granny was wearing hyacinth blue and Biscuit's baby sister Polly was wearing a very cute little mini mouse dress, bright red with little white spots. Even Biscuit's dad looked colourful in a purple shirt and crimson tie. They were such a big, bright, bouncy family, they filled our living room right to the brim. It was a relief after dad had got everyone drinks to spill out into the garden. Biscuit's present, present to me was a little fat Larry glove puppet with short fluffy fur hair and a miniature sparkly green jacket. No trousers because he didn't have any legs. Biscuits made him jump about, waving his arms and waggling his head, doing his own mini fat Larry routine. Do you like me, Gemma? Am I a good birthday present? Little fat Larry asked me, tickling me under the chin and butting me affectionately with the furry skinhead hair. I like you lots and lots, little fat Larry. You're a truly brilliant birthday present, I said. Please thank Biscuits very much indeed. Well, Biscuit's mum made most of me, but he drew my face, said little fat Larry. Biscuit's made all of your cake, though. I can't wait to see it, I said, wondering if it might be a fat Larry cake, and if so, whether I'd really like emerald green icing. Well, I'm going to stand back. I don't want you to throw it at me, said Biscuit's. I know what you like, Gemma. We had the pizzas first. Dad collected them in his taxi. The grown-ups had pretty boring toppings, and little Polly didn't have pizza at all, just breadsticks, though she liked those a lot and used them like drumsticks in, on her fat little tummy. Biscuits and I had a lengthy discussion and came up with a superb ideal pizza. 
tomato sauce, three cheeses, mushroom, sweet corn, tomatoes, pineapple, olives, frankfurter sausage and chicken. Are you sure that's enough toppings, kids? said Dad sarcastically. Well, maybe we could go for salami too. And beef. And some mixed peppers, said Biscuits, taking him seriously. He wolfed his pizza down, no bother at all, and insisted he had heaps of room for birthday cake. I had room inside my tummy too, but no room at all outside, because there was a sh severe shortage of chairs. So Biscuits and I ate our multi-topped pizzas squashed up in my treehouse den. We had to raise our arms simultaneously when we ate for ease of movement. Once or twice, Biscuits found himself absentmindedly taking a big bite out of my pizza as well as his own. He wanted to fetch my cake and light the candles himself, so we had to do a lot of wriggling and heaving and tugging before Biscuits finally popped out of the treehouse like a giant cork from a bottle. I waited for my birthday cake, my heart beating, hard, hard inside my tight t-shirt. I hoped it wasn't going to be a chocolate cream cake like the one I'd made for Alice. I hated thinking about that one now and that, wash, and that wasted wish. Biscuits carefully carried a big plate into the garden, candles flickering. It was a brown cake, but it wasn't any old ordinary chocolate cake. It had a little roof. Maybe Dad had tipped in the wink and it was a treehouse cake. I jumped down to the ground to have a proper look. It wasn't a treehouse. It was a cake in the shape of an old-fashioned well. It was beautifully made. Every little brick outlined in white, with icing flowers all around the base and little marzipan frogs and bunnies and squirrels doing a dance around the well. Biscuits had written... Happy birthday, Gemma, in beautiful copper plate icing writing across the well's roof. It's a wishing well, said Biscuits. You get the biggest birthday wish when you blow your candles out, and then every single slice has a special wish in it too. Oh, Biscuits! I darted forward. Biscuits took one step back, looking nervous. I'm just going to thank you, silly. You blow your candles out first. I don't want the wax dripping all over my cake. Those bricks took ages. You're a brick, Biscuits. The best mate ever, I said. I took a deep breath. I blew hard, and as all the candle flames gave one last flicker, I made my wish. I wished that Biscuits and I would always stay best mates, and that Alice and I could still somehow stay best friends forever too. I knew it was partly a wasted wish, especially as Alice hadn't even sent me a birthday present, but I couldn't help it. What did you wish for, asked Biscuits, as he helped me cut the cake. I can't say, or it won't come true, I said, grinning at him. Well, I won't tell you what I'm wishing for then, said Biscuits, grinning back. We all munched Biscuits' delicious cake. Even Polly licked a little icing very appreciatively. We all wished and wished and wished. Then we heard a knock at the front door. Is this my tall, dark, handsome stranger already, said Mum, giggling. Dad tutted, pretending to be cross. No, it's my blonde, curvy dream girl, he said. They both shook their heads, smiling at each other. Biscuits' Mum and Dad were smiling at each other too. Biscuits' Granny and Grandad weren't just smiling. They were holding hands. Callum and Aisha went sloping off together, holding hands too. Jack pulled a disgusted face and shook paws with barking mad, feeding him cake crumbs. Dad came back through the French windows with a little jiffy bag. It was old Miss Michaels next door. This came special delivery this morning and she took it in for us. It's for you, Jem. It had a Scottish postmark, though I didn't recognise the writing. I tore the envelope open. There was a little silver paper parcel and a birthday card. It showed two little bears having a big hug, one pink, one yellow. It said, happy birthday. Up above them in pink and yellow writing and inside lots of bear hugs, best friend. Underneath, Alice had added, lots and lots and lots of hugs, Jem. I hope you have a very, very happy birthday. I'm having a party, but it won't be at all the same without you. Mum's made me ask Flora, but I don't like her much now. You're still my best friend, ever even though I'm not supposed to get in touch with you anymore. Dad said we'd send you this, though, in a special parcel, because I wanted to send you something precious. He helped me get the new bit, too. Lots and lots, and lots of love from Alice. I opened up the tiny parcel, my hands trembling. It was Alice's silver charm bracelet. Right next to the special little Noah's Ark, there was a brand new silver charm in the shape of a heart. It had four words on it. Best friends forever. And that is the end of Best Friends by Jacqueline Wilson. Hope you enjoyed that story, guys. I will be back soon with lots more stories and lots more videos coming your way very, very soon. If you would like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for your support, guys. Take care. Bye bye.